for questions, but I'll just wait for other participants if they have questions. So participants, please uh, raise your hands if you have any questions. And while people are thinking about that, maybe I'll just ask a quick, quick question using my privileges. So Indonesia, uh, regarding this uh, introducing this uh, new uh, equation of state, which is a very nice trick actually, because you use the non-relativistic formulation, you go, uh, do away with this complication of the uh, you know, tra transformation, the primitive to conservative that we face in relativistic right. Right. equations. But you use a, 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 a relativistic equation of state. Now, right. you have introduced a new equation of state, but often in many other communities, we use something called the Taub equation of state, which I'm sure you yeah. agree. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what yeah. are the differences? Between, because in the paper by Mignoni and McKinney in 2007, yeah. Yeah. they were shown that the Tau uh, approximation will approximate the singe gas. Yeah. So ours are uh, more, uh, so uh, Tau's equation, that is basically uh, the lower limit of Tau's inequality, mm -hmm. uh, was first used by Matthews. So, yes. uh, so it's called TM uh, equation of state uh, in the uh, numerical simulation co uh, community. Uh, ours are better fit with that because tau uh, uh, in the lower energy limit, because uh, in our 2006 paper, we actually uh, compared the equation of states, tau, ours, and the Chandrasekhar equation of state. And uh, in the lower limit, it, it is a little bit hotter. OK. Uh, and ours are much closer. In fact, uh, ours are, if, if you look at, if you remember the plot there, are just slightly less relativistic in the lower limit. In the higher, it's fine, okay? Slightly, okay, uh, in the lower temperature limit. Uh, uh, I, I think in this 2006 paper, we gave an estimate. I think uh, the tau uh, inequality, uh, sorry, the, the TM equation of state is a uh, few percent, and ours is less than one percent. The maximum deviation from uh, the RP equation of state or Chandrasekhar equation of state. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, any uh, other question? Well, there are a lot of implications for the last part of your talk regarding the formation of jets, uh, formation of the shocks in the jets and the collisions. Right. But right. uh, let me wait for others if if there are any other questions. If not, then actually, Indranil, then uh, for other questions from me, I'll write to you separately. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, sure. I will just uh, thank you, Antonil. Uh, thank you very much for coming to and uh, giving this talk here. It was very interesting. Okay, uh, sorry, uh, there's, there is there is one question. Uh, Indu, uh, can you uh, can you unmute yourself, Indu? Now, uh, just hold on. Let me search where you are. Indu, I've allowed you to unmute. Uh, ask your question. Hi, I'm Indu. Hi. hi. It's nice. So I have a question. Regarding, you have used the Pekransky with a potential, right? Yes. yes. So, uh, thing is that, so then I can understand this, uh, the wind or outflow, whatever you are saying, is the powered by the this, uh, this angular momentum or this pressure, basically. Okay. Yes. But if you uh, incorporate the rotation of the black hole, will your result hold? Basically, then the uh, this Z uh, rotation, uh, black hole rotation powered Z uh, or the Outflow, it may take uh, over your outflow, right? No, but I am not getting a question. Uh, what do you mean by uh, uh, are you talking about the Blanford's Nyack mechanism? That is a completely different thing, okay? No, no, right, right. Basically, mm -hmm. when you are starting with it, if the rotation is there and then the, all the other things will be appeared in the flow, right? Oh, are you, are you talking about uh, using a uh, car uh, pseudo potential, something like that? Not really pseudo, pseudo potential or what? I mean, I am just, it's my. Like, yeah, yeah, it, should, like, it should, it should hold. I mean, you see, I mean, if it is, I mean, for car, it is, if it is not more than 90% the speed of, uh, sorry. And, uh, I mean, if it's the car parameter is not greater than 0.95, the changes are very, very little, okay? Only very close to the horizon, you find some deviations. That's number one. Number two is that uh, uh, whether it is a, a, a car or whether it is a, a, a Schwarzschild, the jets, it's my belief, the jets are coming out because of the uh, of the plasma effects. Okay, of course it is coupled with the 
uh, with the uh, gravitational space time and so on. But uh, it's basically the plasma effect that, are, that they're launching the jets. Okay, and once it leaves the jet, uh, I mean, sorry, the, the disk, okay, then, okay, fine. I mean, there will be changes in the, because of the geometry very close by, it, there will be some changes, but I mean, why should not it hold? I no, no, basically what I was thinking that yeah, maybe Hindu, uh, maybe just interject here we, because we're running short on time. Okay, I have one more question. Fine. Okay, it's fine. Okay, I, I you can get... write to me then if you if you have some questions. Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, once again, Indranil, uh, uh, thanks a lot for this very interesting talk, and then uh, we'll move to the next speaker, Prayush. Okay. I should unshare it first. Yes, please. Prayush is a co-host, so Prayush, uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, share your screen. So Prayush will be talking to us a, a bit more about the technical details about uh, the numerical relativity calculations that we do. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Prayush, we can hear you. Okay. So thank you for introducing me. Uh, my name is Prish Kumar. I'm at ICTS at the moment. And I today wanted to discuss uh, doing numerical relativity at scale, especially going forward with the, with the future generation of supercomputers that's coming up. And this will be in the context of a new code that we're developing as part of the simulating extreme space-time collaboration it's called Spectre. So jumping straight into it, what do what what numerical relativity is a rather diverse field and you can tackle many problems in it. The specific problems that we are interested in is the dynamics of compact object systems in the context of LIGO. So for instance, here is a movie that shows a full GR solution of two black holes orbiting each other, where the two black holes have masses and spins corresponding to the first gravitational event that LIGO and the LIGO detector saw five years ago. And uh, the colors in here show the curvature of three-dimensional space. And sorry, the color actually show the time dilation and the depth here show the curvature of 3D space. And the two black objects here are the individual apparent horizons of the two black holes that are about to merge at this point. And the gravitational wave signal that is being emitted is being traced out at the bottom right here. So the movie slows down close to the point where the two black holes sort of collide. When by collide, I mean a common apparent horizon is first found. And after that point, the common apparent horizon it revolves, it shades away its anisotropies in gravitational waves. And all these gravitational waves are emitted outward in the simulation domain. And we collect them out in the domain. And uh, that's what we expect to see at the future null infinity, which is where our LIGO detectors are situated. Right, so this is this is uh, the simulation that went into the original paper that uh, was published with the discovery of this event. And here's another simulation, but here this time we have a neutron star orbiting a black hole three times its mass. And as you can see, as the neutron star comes close to coming into contact with the black hole, it's tidally disrupted, forming uh, a accretion disk of new of fluid matter. Right, And so this is, again, an example of an event that we haven't seen yet in the gravitational wave spectrum, but we hope to be able to see in the future. So these are the kind of problems that I work on uh, in the field of numerical relativity. And why are they of interest? Well, as we know that the era of gravitational wave astronomy has begun, and it is currently being dominated by a, by a large population of heavy black holes. So here is a figure that I, Shukant also showed us earlier in the session. So all of these heavy black holes, what we can see with the ground-based detectors are really the strong field dynamics happening in a few orbits before they merge. And it's in these orbits that a full numerical solution of, of, for the waveform is really important, not only to detect these objects, or these events, but also to decipher all the physics that's happening in there. On the other side of the same spectrum are the neutron star neutron star mergers that we have only seen two of. But then again, a big problem and a big important problem that LIGO aims to solve is uh, the question of how short gamma ray bursts 
are formed? And what is the role of binary neutron star mergers in them? Of course, we found very strong statistical evidence that uh, the merger of two neutron stars may be the progenitor of short gamma ray bursts, but we don't understand how that happens. There are many numerical simulations uh, that are able to produce these uh, bursts numerically in computers, but then again, they require uh, using some approximation or some tweak to the initial conditions. And we don't yet have an ab initio satisfactory understanding of how this phenomenon is actually happening. So, so in, uh, the, in the business of solving Einstein's equations, which is the, the hard part in doing numerical activity, at least it was at the beginning, uh, the way we do it is we divide the four-dimensional space-time into slice, three-dimensional slices of space along that go, uh, along uh, arbitrarily chosen time coordinate. And this time coordinate is chosen to be somewhat well-behaved in terms of uh, its numerical behavior. That gives us six second order couple uh, partial differential equations that are hyperbolic form. And they tell us how various curvature quantities evolve from one spatial slice to the next and to the next and so on. And we also get four second order elliptic part uh, PDEs that must remain satisfied amongst the curvature information on each of these slices individually. And while doing numerical solutions, what we do is actually simply evolve these six equations while uh, hoping, or there's, a, there's a, a clever way that how we treat these constrained equations in order to avoid actually solving for them at every time step. So, so what has made all of this challenging? Because you know uh, the first simulations of black, many black holes were attempted way early in 1960s, and it was not before early 2000s that a final black hole merger was produced. It took more than four decades to do this. And there are several factors that went into why, what made it so difficult. The first, of course, is we have a wide range of length scales, right? Because if we take the small black hole to be all size of order one, then the, the distance between the two black holes may be of order 10, the wavelength of emitted waves may be of order 100. And we want to put the outer boundary of our simulation domain at least 10 times outside, 10 times uh, lambda GW outside of the system. So as you can see, we have, we have three to four orders of magnitude in length scales to resolve. Then uh, it wasn't known exactly what coordinates to use for a space time, which we don't know yet, right? Because that's the whole goal of evolving. We didn't know how the field rather does, didn't know what the space time would look like near the merger of two black holes. Then of course, putting a singularity on a grid can be troublesome for, for obvious reasons. And this, this was a challenging problem. A couple of different ways of tackling it were invented, but really the hardest problem was the, the fourth one here, which is that the violation of Einstein constraint equations, they always seem to grow, grow exponentially, starting from uh, numerical, numerical errors, we found an exponential growth in the violations of these four constraint equations, which are basically three momentum and Hamiltonian constraint equations or GR. And this was what remained untamed for several decades and uh, which, which, which uh, basically was resolved in early 2000s where Franz Pretorius's first uh, solutions to the full problem of PBH merger. Of course, amongst other challenges are resolving shocks in a dynamical uh, geometry. And of course, are the computational challenges as to, we are, we are solving six uh, equations in tensors, which give us between 20 to 50 free variables. And because of the smallest length scale in the system, if we take a global time step, if we do global time stepping, then because the current condition tells us that our time step should be as small as roughly the smallest length scale of the system. And which, which again, increases the computation cost. And of course, we, most of the codes, including our original code, wasn't using our, all the computing that was available to us efficiently. And uh, finally, all of these challenges, they tie into the fact that the solution required by LIGO has to be quite accurate to the phase errors that was allowed that was less than one radian and more than 20 orbits, which is uh, not, not the easiest thing to get. But a lot of these challenges have actually been overcome. 
already. So uh, at this point, I wanted to introduce our original first code that made the two movies that I showed you earlier. This was called the Spectral Einstein Code. And this was developed in collaboration with uh, people at Cornell and Caltech and CETA and Max Planck and California State University and Washington State and ICTS as well. So the problems two, three, and four are currently the most researched problems and they have been pretty much solved. We have several ways of representing singularities on a grid. We can, uh, we, I'm not going to go into the details of that. We have several ways of making sure that the constraints of the Einstein system don't grow. They remain near, as near zero as we want. At least they remain at a control level. And um, we have again have a bunch of different coordinates or coordinate gauges available that are uh, relatively you know, amenable to numerical simulation. So that is all fine. Even length scales we are able to resolve by using a uh, highly adaptive mesh refinement that is available in spec, right? But the problem of resolving different time scales uh, brought in by the presence of different length scales is not very well resolved and it is a bottleneck in our simulations. In fact, Shukanto pointed out, if we have a very high mass ratio system, the smaller black hole becomes much smaller, say 100 times smaller than the, the bigger black hole, then the distance between them are smallest and largest length scales are separated by five orders of magnitude. And at that point, global time stepping simply makes the simulations crawl at a very slow speed. And I'll talk about why. Again, uh, resolving shocks is something we can do, but not very satisfactory. And uh, the first and fifth problem then tie in very deeply into the question of computation challenges and the accuracy requirement, of course. So, so what do we do, right? Uh, all the, the physics part of the questions, physics problems have been so somewhat solved. So we went back to the drawing board and we took stock of what was all wrong with spec. And we did a thorough literature survey of what all is being done in different fields uh, of you know, uh, fluid dynamics, for instance, MHD, for example, and different computing schemes that have been used over the development of cloud computing in the past five to 10 years and so on. And we found that the combination of three key things can together alleviate all of these problems here. So the first thing that we need is a better discretization screen, right? Uh, the way we discretize the semi-discrete uh, form of our evolution equations, we want, it, we want the scheme to be local at high order, right? Uh, we want that it can handle discontinuities. It can handle shocks well without requiring too many extra grid points or without destroying the accuracy of the solution. And uh, we also want our scheme to be amenable to inhomogeneous grid. So for example, here I'm showing the typical grid that we use around a two black hole system. And you can see the inhomogeneity of the grid. The grid is much more dense near the smaller black hole and in between the two black holes than as compared to the outer wave zone where not much exciting is really happening there except for the wave propagation, right? Then a major shortcoming of the current computing uh, in our course that we have is the parallelization scheme that have been used. And the current scheme simply do not scale Right, so so it's 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 common knowledge that Moore's law is broken. We don't get, we're not getting faster and faster computers anymore. What we are getting, however, is bigger and bigger clusters of many many cores thrown into it. Maybe hundred cores, thousand cores, as many cores as you want. But the speed, the computing speed of each core is not growing up, not growing. So we want to be able to parallelize our calculations in a way that can actually make use of that fact efficiently. And the third pre-ingredient is uh, the use of local time stepping. This will allow us to evolve the evolution equations of the Einstein system, of the hydrodynamic systems, maybe the MHD system, according to the, the local requirement of the length scales of the problem. So wherever the length scales are small, we need to take small time steps, yes. But where the length scales are clearly very large, 
why should we continue to take the same small time steps and local time stepping is a technique that allows us to not do that so i'll be talking about each of these three things in order uh so let's start, think about discretization first right so the oldest form of discretization is methods is the finite difference method where you have you say your solution and it's represented by its value at a few collocation points that and the domain is itself a set the set of these points now the solution again is can be thought of as being represented locally by a polynomial uh interpolator and if you want to construct say the derivatives of your solution field at this point or uh, you need to take information from the neighboring points and as you want to take a higher order derivative not the second derivative but the fourth order first derivative uh then you need to have more then you need to involve information from more and more points on either side of your current point which means that while the the scheme is local at low order as you increase from second third fourth to sixth seventh or eighth order it doesn't remain local anymore right it can handle discontinuities but it does so at the cost of reducing accuracy uh, quite a bit or requiring a very uh, high density of the grid again the finite difference methods can't handle inhomogeneous grids very much very well because of uh, some problems that arise when trying to compute derivatives at the uh, at you know um at the interfaces between different elements in your grid so if this is your homogeneous grid along the boundaries of these elements from going one to the other uh it, the, the the finite difference formally become quite large very fast right so the next popular method then the field is to use spectral methods now spectral method in spectral method solution is expanded on a local basis now the domain is no longer a set of points domain is a set of connected non overlapping intervals and here i am showing the first and second uh, basis functions which in each of these elements so of course that is the constant and a straight line uh, function right and any given solution can be expressed as the sum of those two basis functions of course you can take the 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 expansion to higher and higher order by taking the next order basis function and the next and the next and so on and in fact in this is the method that is currently being used by the spec code and we typically use between 10 to 12 basis basis uh, elements in each of uh, each of the sub domains of our full domain right the problem of course with this solutions discretization scheme is that it requires exact or strict continuity of the solution field across all the domain boundaries right so so it doesn't it's not able to handle discontinuities at all and in fact if if uh, discontinuities form it destroys the solution globally so for example when we were doing simulations of the neutron star being ripped apart by the black hole we actually had two different grids the space time was evolved on a spectral grid while the matter equations were being solved on a finite volume uh, grid and they would communicate with each other at every time step a uh, finite difference grid actually and they would communicate with each other at every time step making our grmhd simulations very very slow right so so spec while it has locality at low order locality at high order it can handle inhomogeneous grid it really can't handle discontinuities right and and another important thing of spectral method is that your derivatives come for free all your spatial derivatives are free and exact there is no numerical error because your i mean your solution is expand, expanded in set of basis functions so your derivative operator only acts on the basis functions okay then then another uh, discretization scheme that is common in in uh, certain fields is that of finite volume methods so there the solution is represented by cell averages so here again is the domain 
in one dimension. These are the elements in the domain, and the the solution, the, the true solution, is represented by the cell average in each cell. Right. So the transfer of information here requires the uh, pro prescribing a numerical flux, and there is some arbitrariness in how we can prescribe this flux, and that allows for discontinuities to be handled well. Right, so if if a shock, say, instant, for example, forms in the central domain here, uh, one can construct the fluxes from this domain to the left and the right in a way that these domains do not feel the Gibbs oscillations resulting from the presence of a shock in this domain. But just like the finite disappearance screens, uh, finite volume methods also require a wide stencil when taking derivatives. They, there is no spec, there's no basis expansion in each element. So every time you want to take a derivative of the solution at any point, you need to involve the cells, the neighboring cells. And as the higher, as the order of the derivative grows, you need to involve more and more of the neighboring cells. So this scheme is again, not suited for our purposes because it's no longer local at high order. So we turn finally to this uh, a type of finite element method called discontinuous Gilerkin method, which is which is different from usual finite element methods because finite element methods are again similar to spectral methods. You have domains, you have spectral expansion of the solution, but usual finite element methods they again require strict continuity of the solution across domains, but not DG. DG allows for arbitrary fluxes to be provided across element boundaries. So in this sense, DG takes the best of both worlds. It takes the best of the spectral approximation and the finite volume methods, right? And because the solution is again expanded locally in each element, you have uh, high accuracy in all, you can have as high accuracy as you want in the smooth regions, while you can reduce the, the order in regions that are developing shocks and the neighbors will not feel the effect of it. So it's local at all orders, it can handle discontinuities and it, it, it is quite amenable to using in homogeneous grids, just like finite volume methods, right? So the second key thing that we took is local time stepping. So the, I, I, I'm sure that the audience here knows that uh, the introduction of a large range of length scales is quite common in numerical relativity. And in such inhomogeneous situations, we end up wasting a lot of computing time by taking global time steps. So this is, for example, the full simulation domain for a binary black hole system. The binary black holes are right there in the center. It's, it's very hard to even see them. Most of the domain outside is empty and not much is happening there. And still, the size of the time step everywhere is being governed by the, the size of the horizon oscillations on the smaller black hole right in there, right? So in order to alleviate that, we, we uh, adopt local time stepping, which allows us to take small steps in the neighborhood of the smaller black hole, right? And rather steps of as much size as you want in a local region while not imposing the CFL condition globally. And whatever information is say needed from the neighboring elements while taking these small steps is obtained by extrapolating the solution say in this element from the past a little bit into the future. And yeah, this, this allows for a huge gain or rather a huge uh, reduction in time stepping cost. Okay, so another new paradigm that Spectre adopts, and this is really the revolutionary uh, technical change that is being used here, is the parallelization scheme that we do. So currently all codes that I'm, at least that I'm aware of, um, the way they parallelize the solution of the problem is that they assign each element to its own core or to its own CPU. 
and all the computation of the derivatives, the right-hand sides of Einstein equation, of Euler equation, or whatever system you're evolving. For that domain happen on happens on that core. And you can, of course, uh, maybe use four cores for that domain or eight cores per each domain and so on. But the point is the parallelization is done based on how the problem looks in the spatial uh, dimensions, right? Which again, in the presence of inhomogeneous lens scales leads to a lot of wastage. For example, what happens really is, you, I'm showing only four tasks here, but what happens is if you're running this simulation on 80 cores, right? Then most of the 80 cores, approximately above 72 cores of those 80 cores would complete the calculations in less than half the time, as much as it would take the smallest computer to finish its calculations. And the smallest computer, that task, that core will typically be solving, you know, uh, will typically be revolving, doing the right-hand sides around the smaller black hole. So, we end up wasting a lot of core hours simply waiting for the slowest guy to finish. The task-based... We're just uh, running a bit short on time, so I'll ask you to please uh, wrap up in a few minutes. Thank you. Sure, sure. I'm almost done. So, so what we do is a task-based parallelization scheme. So now this parallelization scheme has nothing to do with how the problem looks. So suppose this is a computational domain. This is all the cyan of the squares are our elements. The purple ones are the interfaces between the elements, right? And say we need to calculate volume derivatives here and the flux terms on the purple uh, rectangles here. All of these calculation requirements are taken in a global object space. Their dependencies are calculated. And then there's a, there's a scheduler process, the task-based scheduler that reorders these calculations and redistributes them to each of these cores. And while some of these calculations are running and the others are waiting to run, the scheduler figures out what data is needed for the wait for the next calculations. And it starts to already copy over data for those calculations. And in doing that, the cost of communicating data is pretty much hidden behind the cost of doing the actual calculations, right? So, Right, so it, it results in an, an asynchronous execution of the tasks, right? If th these are the three execution phases, bits of each of the three phases are ordered in terms of their strict dependency and they can be executed in pretty much arbitrary order as long as their strict dependency is obey. So finally, let's move on to some quick results. So our code is still under development. It's, it's been under development for about six and a half, seven years now. Uh, this is, uh, this is, these are some scaling results on the blue waters machine that I'm showing here for the 2D, uh, for 2D MHD equations being solved for the Orzac tank vortex, which is essentially a problem where four or two, five different shock fronts form and they interact with each other to get supersonic, uh, MHD turbulence. Now, the thing to note here is how well it's how well spectral solutions scale from as few as 20 cores to as high as half a million cores or at least quarter of a million cores here right so this is this is the kind of scaling that that task based parallelism uh, enables all of our current cores they scale well up to approximately 100 cores after which point distributing the computing on more and more computers no longer helps, right? So, yeah, so this is, this is, so one more thing I wanted to point out about this figure is that um, it is possible to use current methodologies to scale this well, but it typically takes several postdoc or team years to actually do it on a single machine. While this figure was made by Scott Field at UMass Dartmouth, and where he took the code directly from his laptop, Spectre code from his laptop to the Blue Waters cluster, when within a day he was able to achieve the scaling, which means that this is not after several rounds of hardware optimization and so on that we get this. It's really the power of task-based parallelism that we are seeing here. And yeah, so this is some more results on, on how um, task-based parallelism performs. 
Um, so y-axis shows the total CPU usage as a function of time. So this simulation is being done on a single core. So you can see everything is happening in order because there's only one core. But as you include say 12 cores, first of all, you can see that still almost all the CPU is being used at all times, right? No computing is being wasted. But the synchronicity of the task is being lost. There's no strict synchronicity anymore. And that's the nature of asynchronous task-based piloting. So this, this is a problem where we have a cylindrical magnetized uh, blast wave expanding into a region of low density. And this is for the, for the Orzang vortex MHD problem. And here the, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a similar result. It starts out as synchronized and becomes asynchronous later. The black shows the cost of doing the scheduling of the tasks. And for this problem, the, the scheduler was actually quite expensive, but still we are still using 100% of all the CPUs available at all times. So there is really no wastage at all of computing. Right, so, so to conclude, um, Spectre is a radically forward-looking uh, computational physics code, I would say. It's not just astrophysics code uh, that adopts the current best known paradigms in all relevant you know, uh, things. For example, the way we discretize, the way we do time stepping, our handle inhomogeneous style, length and time scales, and the way we parallelize our calculations. And as you have already seen, task-based parallelism scales very well. And there's no reason it will not scale to the future of exact scale computing. And as to the status of Spectre, um, Einstein and MHD equations have been implemented. Uh, we are done with boundary conditions for both the evolution systems. We are still awaiting control systems uh, to be implemented, which will control how the adaptive mesh refinement works and how, how we track the apparent horizons of the black holes uh, dynamically. So that is still ongoing. And I also wanted to highlight that Spectre is completely open source. It's on GitHub and anyone can use it, contribute to it, and we welcome that. So with that, I will conclude. Well, th yeah. thanks a lot, Prayush. And this was a fascinating talk, especially for a finite volume person to see the updates and the optimization you've, you've managed you know, with this hybrid uh, structure that you have. It's very fascinating. So I'll open the floor for questions. Shukanto has a question, but before Shukanto, I'll use my chair privileges again to ask you a question myself. Now, when you are talking about this, um, uh, uh, different things about the uh, uh, discontinuous galaxy and the finite volume and how they are different and how you can take the both worlds. But also in finite volume, you know, we go do go up to higher order accuracies by using higher reconstruction methods and that gives you, you know, a way of the solution between these two edges. So in discontinuous galaxy, do you also need to do that? My first question. And the second question is in the DG method as well, do you still need to have a Riemann problem at the edges? Yes, yeah. Uh, to answer the second question first, yes, we do have a Riemann problem. We still need, and in fact, we borrow, we are currently borrowing most of the fluxes that we uh, that people in the finite volume community uses. And for this first question, uh, we don't need to reconstruct for higher deriv derivatives because uh, we are expanding the solution on a local basis in each element. And typically third to fourth order, we take four, three to maybe even five basis elements in this expansion. And we find that if we keep the elements small enough, that much is uh, using that many element that's many uh, basis functions per element is good enough so i think i had a result plot here so here's for example the l1 error in one of the evolved fields right uh, as a function of the number of polynomials we use in each element in our domain okay. and in yeah your act of decomposition is same as the reconstruction in, in some sense oh uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, except this is strictly except this is strictly local so uh, nice. you don't need information from your neighbors in this. So let Shukanto ask, then I have a question as well. For yes. uh, Shukanto, please go ahead with your yes. question. Okay, yeah, thanks uh, Prish, for a nice talk. I have a somewhat broad question. You know, um, something like eight to nine years ago, various numerical relativity communities got together and they uh, compared their uh, binary black hole waveforms. That was a very um, uh, assuring exercise because uh, we could um, check um, how consistent the different codes were. Uh, and, and that then gives us the confidence to pursue real data. 
uh, with, with the best waveforms we had then. Um, um, binary neutron star waveforms have also uh, somewhat benefited uh, with this kind of comparison. But then, you know, the, one of the next discovery spaces is uh, post-merger waveforms for neutron stars. And there uh, we know that uh, um, things are not quite consistent. Um, do you have any notion for what would be required to uh, achieve consistency for the post-merger object uh, across different codes? So the answer is in resolution. We don't resolve the post-merger if it simply doesn't collapse to a black hole. We don't resolve the post-merger dynamics very well if there's an accretion disk, for example. And we lose energy and momentum for that. And that's responsible for a lot of the inaccuracies. And that's, again, got to do with the fact that to resolve the disk, you need to resolve a much smaller length scale than other parts of your domain. And already the cost of, you know, evolving MHD in full GR is so high. Um, doing that makes the simulations very slow, or rather sometimes even not possible. We become communication dominated very quickly, very fast. And that again has to do with the use of MPI. So task-based parallelism, I think, will go a long way into allowing us to use as much resolution as we need locally around around those accretion points. And yeah, that's a, yeah. currently we are limited by the technical frameworks that were developed over the last two decades. Computers have evolved, our frameworks have not. We have done improvements, yes, but you know, not orders of magnitude of improvement that are really genuinely scalable. We have available at you know ten thousand cores, but that doesn't mean any BNS simulation can go to that level. In fact, right now the most a BNS simulation scales to is with spec is ninety to hundred and ten cores. That's it. So having so much more computing available does not make the problem easier anymore, which me also translates to the amount of human time that elapses per simulation, right? And I, you are well aware of that it easily takes between three to four months for one simulation. And if you wanted to double the resolution with global time stepping, then we are quickly looking at six months to maybe a year. And that's outside the uh, realm of our patients. So really it's, it's how we are wasting computing at this time is, is needs to change, which is what we are trying right. to do with Spectre. And that's the problem you point out is one of the primary problems for designing Spectre to begin with. That and very high mice ratio binary black holes. Well, uh, um, maybe we can move to Bhargav for the next question, please. Bhargav. Yeah, yeah, Pravyush, a very, very nice talk. Uh, I just have one question. See, naively, if you take a spherical geometry into any computation, you are actually marred by the singularity that exists at uh, t equal to zero. Of course, there are several techniques to get out of it. I would like to understand what your uh, code uses in order to get rid of the singularity. Because for you, I think it is extremely crucial to have right. no singularity at when you are learning about binary merger or something like that. How do you do this? Correct. So that's, that's a excellent question. And I purposely glossed over that technical point. <laughs> Sorry to but bother what, you for that. No, no, absolutely. Uh, what we do is we excise out the singularity. So what we do is we have control systems that every time step make sure that we find the exact apparent horizon of both black holes. Exactly. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. we regrid the whole domain. Our adaptive mesh readapts at every time step sort of to, to um, extend the domain only just inside the apparent horizon. So here, for example, oops. Here, for example, is the innermost sphere of our yeah. domain. Mm -hmm. For the bigger mm -hmm. black hole and for the smaller black hole. Mm -hmm. And this means that the, the two apparent horizons lie just outside this sphere. I see. So essentially we are excising away the singularity. The other way is in finite difference codes that people use is, is to simply avoid the singularity landing on the domain. It's called yeah. a puncture method where you treat, treat it as a puncture method. You, it has its own pros and cons, but on a on a spectral grid, which spec uses and spectre will also use, it will still use spectral 
decomposition yeah. within each element you can't as you rightly pointed out you can't have any contact with the singularity otherwise you'll have to redo the whole expansion again exactly and and choosing this method doesn't affect your parallelization very much am i right it affects <laughs> <laughs> so this is the perfect slide to answer this question so for example this task here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is uh, what it is doing is finding the horizon for the smaller black hole i see got it yeah so we have to yeah, find yeah. the horizon at every time step and that's what's slow yeah got so again this redistributing it using task based parallelism means that as soon as you are done solving equations everywhere else all your hundreds of cores will start solving for the apparent horizon finding Good. they will not be waiting for one single computer to finish this task they will okay. all chip in yeah well okay. uh, let thanks, me thanks. interject here and maybe we stop the discussion so it's it's already late so i don't think we have time for discussion but i'll just take this opportunity to thank all the speakers for this wonderful series of talks in this session and it was very illuminating and to see how numerical relativity is actually being uh, useful now and uh, being expanded to large hpc systems and giving us uh, good results so with this i thank and um, thank all the speakers again and then uh, hand over to sharanya for some closing remarks yeah uh, thank you very much uh, <clears throat> so it was actually great to see that some of the ideas from fluid dynamics computational fluid dynamics being adapted to numerical relativity uh, i was very pleased to see that uh, and uh, so uh, just to summarize uh, so we had a whole range of uh, talks uh, which was uh, divided into four sessions, uh, starting from core development strategies to solar and stellar physics, galactic and extra galactic scales, and then uh, astrophysical relativity. And uh, when we were in the stage of proposing this workshop, so it was our unanimous decision that if we are, if we were to conduct such a workshop, so we would like to bring together people from different fields of astrophysics where the common thread was, uh, they were all doing computation or some aspects of computation so that uh, you know the participants uh, should get an overall view an overall landscape and i think uh, that today that probably has been achieved and all of us have something to take home uh, from this uh, meeting particularly our young students uh, who would i who i hope will be the simulators of tomorrow and uh, they <laughs> uh, so I hope that they have uh, sort of got an idea of the landscape uh, of computational astrophysics and what uh, different uh, fields of, uh, of astrophysics are requiring at this moment and uh, what are the methods that are being used and uh, collaborations and many things. Uh, so, uh, so just to close this uh, workshop formally, so I would like to uh, thank the uh, Scientific Organizing Committee and the VOC of ASI and then all the all our invited uh, speakers so they have been always very uh, responsive to our mails uh, uh, for uh, abstract submission and things like that uh, and uh, also our participants so we have had a very enthusiastic uh, response uh, so we have we had almost about 250 people registering for this uh, workshop so which was pretty huge uh, number and last but not the least, uh, our student volunteers, they're four in number. So Orgodeep and Gaurav from IIT Indore and Binakshi and Ankush uh, from Ayuka. So let's give them a big hand. Uh, so they have been handling and monitoring all our YouTube, Slack and everything and uh, pointing out to us if, if uh, there is something to, uh, to, uh, for, for, to, to you know, pay attention to. And uh, you know the Slack channel will remain open, so anybody who has any questions can still post uh, there. And I encourage our invited speakers to please uh, at attend to those things. And uh, lastly, if you have any feedbacks or comments, you can uh, say it here or you can write to us uh, in what ways we could have done it better or things like that. So, so I would end by saying that let us hope that this is the first workshop uh, in this uh, thing, and uh, in the in the near future we will see more such workshops uh, spread out over uh, maybe one week or two weeks uh, more focused and we could arrange them at various places in India. Uh, so that, that would be really uh, good. Uh, so with that, I would like to end. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay.